Don't you want to die happy with a smile on your face? Wake up a laughing, cause you're free of all the things that would hold you from your ocean view. Life's a landscape, why don't you paint it your way? Don't you want to live carefree? Hi, Julia. Hi, Martin. Do you know what? I was just sitting here looking into your beautiful Icelandic blue pool eyes. Feeling very grateful. Oh, well, when I eventually took off my sunglasses. When you eventually took off your sunglasses. So for those of you who can't see Julia's eyes for obvious reasons, because this is a podcast, <laughs> she has got the loveliest blue eyes. Oh, you're such a sweetheart. Thanks. Well, it's a week of gratitude, I think. I've been pondering since our interview with Jake and my interview with Terry, uh, and we're going to talk about all that in a minute, uh, about gratitude Mm. and about, because of course the, the, the two interviews are largely to do with addiction and recovery. And as some people will know, I'm nearly four years clean and sober. Mm -hmm. And yeah, listening to the interviews, to do the edits, and having been involved with some Facebook communities around addiction recently, so I can talk about the podcast, I'm really, I'm feeling very, very grateful. And I'm grateful for you. Oh, thank you very much. And gratitude it's kind of one of the best things to feel, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, we discussed this on the Chinwag with, with Terry and I uh, this week. We were talking about how if people are struggling to find a meditation, perhaps gratitude is a really good good place to start. Because if you can put yourself into a calm state and consider what you are grateful for, you can literally open your heart right there and then, can't you? Yeah, and just taking the time every day to perhaps write it down. You can use it in a journal practice or just say it out loud. Like, you know, maybe when you wake up, three things that you're grateful for. And then the end of the day, when you're going to bed, another three things that you're grateful for. And that's actually a really nice exercise to do together. Hmm. So perhaps I might start asking you every night to to tell me three things you're grateful for before you go to sleep. If I list both of your eyes, does that count as two? <laughs> you can only do that one day. Okay. That's fine, that counts as two. I'll create, my left and my right. I'll create a longer list and, and rotate them. Yeah, and the other thing is... <laughs> <laughs> what? I was going to edit that. You can't laugh. <laughs> well, you can't edit it now because well, I laugh. Well, I can. <laughs> oh. uh, okay, maybe I won't edit it. It'll just be a really long, quiet pause. Sorry, folks. The other thing I like to do is to regularly express gratitude to myself. Yeah. Not in a self congratulatory, aren't you brilliant? sort of way more in a thank you for bringing you to this place thanks for for the choices you made thanks for turning up thanks for working on awareness and observation and trying to be a better person thanks for the mindfulness yeah that's a good one and also another good one is to remember to thank your body Mm. You know, when I, when I finish class, when I teach the end of every session, not every session, but when I, you know, feel the need to, I always, always ask people to firstly really thank themselves for showing up, but then also that reminder that we actually have to thank our bodies. Yeah, we absolutely do. And, uh, I think it's probably worth remembering also that words are spells. So what we put out there, the energy that we put out there really does count and I think when you, when you express this gratitude, either internally 
in, quietly in your mind or externally actually vocalize it or as you say write it down so these, these are really powerful manifestation tools mm. yeah are you um are you grateful for our dogs <laughs> <laughs> And the many, many lessons they teach you every day. Uh, yeah, I suppose I am. <laughs> I'm grateful that they haven't yapped yet and they're not in this episode. Although if I think on, they are in this episode later on. Um, yeah, they have to make an appearance in each episode. It's kind of their, their jam. Yeah, Atti and Muda uh, are part of the How to Die Happy Collective now, really, aren't they? Although I'm not sure how insightful their input ever is on our episodes oh i don't know maybe it brings a little something to everybody it's always nice to have a dog around a dog well, yeah we have two we do <laughs> um yeah i am grateful i am grateful to those two dogs for the mindfulness lessons they've been serving up on <laughs> 17 damn times a day the patience levels well i as as we've discussed before i've i've had some fairly tempestuous weeks uh, in recently thanks to the detox which is six days away from closure <laughs> and i am feeling a bit happier and a little bit must have, a little less emotional hmm. it's been a roller coaster hasn't it, it, has, it has. anyway so who is on this week's How to Die Happy podcast? On this week's podcast, we have Jake McKenzie. Jake McKenzie, cosmic wizard. <laughs> so can you tell the folks at home a little bit about the incredible Jake McKenzie? Yeah, of course. Jake is a waterman. He is a very, very keen surfer and an adventurer. We first met him in his cafe, Come Shop in um, Binging, in Uluwatu. And um, we actually bumped into him in his library, his uh, bookshop. And we got chatting and found out, realized he was the owner. And he has just created this incredible space that we very much call our second home. We've spent a lot of time in Drifter, eating their very, very good food and buying a lot of books. Yeah, I mean, shameless plug for Drifter. Anyone finding themselves in Bali, not just Uluwatu. If you are in Bali and you want to go to a cool place, cool surf shop, great cafe, wonderful staff, amazing food, and lots of cool stuff. Well, I mean, I kind of blame Drifter for the reason we're both on this detox because they, they do incredible vegan and non-vegan, but for us, we have sampled the vegan, the vegan desserts. Mm. And we first got hooked on their vegan chocolate chip cookies. And then this just grew and grew until we were eating dessert every day. Yeah. Chocolate mousse and their wagon wheel smashed up in the chocolate mousse. <laughs> so shameless plug for Drifter, Surf and Cafe. He's a guy that's definitely lived his dreams and also got himself through addiction. Um, starting off by cycling from Prague to Israel as he was trying to get through through his habit. And um, that's just very, very inspiring. He's also a father. He's got three children and just seems to be living, really living his dream life. Yeah. Yeah. It's, whenever we get a guest on to the show, I always ask myself, which of the the top 10 common deathbed regrets kind of resonates theme wise with with this guest and often it's more than one quite clearly but with jake it's it's a load it's a load of them because he's he's 26 years clean and sober and he is a, a, an incredible example of of what life can look like after addiction and as he discusses in the episode uh, jake had um uh, heroin addiction amongst other things uh, which is one of the more tricky drugs to kick. And what he's done with his life uh, after recovering is just, it's just phenomenal. You know, he's got this amazing life, as you say, living his best life in, in uh, on the, the, the Bucket Peninsula of Bali. And he, he owns a, a surf shop. He's a, a crazy mad surfer. He's also a, a spear gun fisherman. So he does free diving as well. And uh, he likes to get out and about on boats and travels all around the Indonesian islands, surfing and fishing. But 
I I really really enjoy Jake's take on life. Actually, he's he's a very he's become a, a very grounded, spiritualized person, isn't hasn't he? I think, but there's no pomp or pretense. He just you know he's a dude with a t shirt and some swimmers on. <laughs> yeah, he's very <laughs> very gen- genuine. Yeah, and um, it's infectious actually. His his zest for life is very very infectious. It is, and his energy. Wow, guys, I tell you, listen to the whole episode because uh, um, I think at some point it's during the be my guest section. He answers a couple of questions, and so we we just to give you an idea, we we did a couple of interviews, Jake included. Uh, at this uh, outside this kind of villa on this terrace nestled into the cliffside of Bingin Beach which is quite a steep cliff uh, in southern Bali and the ocean was pounding against the uh, the rocks and the, obviously the beach not f- not far at all from our terrace so you've got the sound of the sea through the entire interview and Jake would just to answer these questions he would just close his eyes we all sat around a table we were all sitting on the floor outdoors and he just closed his eyes to answer these questions and that was it was a wonderful thing to witness yeah man well without giving it all away should we just get on with it yeah let's let's listen to jake this is jake mckenzie let me die in peace in peaceful fields full of wheat and a breeze that's sweet in some place where we all grew our own food in community with friends and family that love the sea and they love to see when i'm doing really good well you've done some stuff jake but what's the wildest adventure you've ever been on Uh, that's, of all the what many. a way to start. What a question. The wildest adventure would have to be, you know, not mincing words, but the journey of recovery. But, but, but that's not really a short uh, sprint. It's more of a marathon. If I was to isolate one wild journey, I would have to say that um, riding a bicycle from Prague to Jerusalem when I was 20 was a pretty wild journey. <laughs> Walk me through that, or or ride me through it. Sure, I'll pedal. I'll <laughs> start pedaling away. So I, I suppose I have to pre precursor the actual riding by just saying that I was um, living in Prague, where I had um, f- found myself or awoken one uh, one day, not from a sleep, but from a, a stupor. And I was in a pretty dark place, um, physically, spiritually, mentally. And I was very much deep in the grips of addiction, primarily heroin and um, everything. More. More and more. More. Just pretty much uh, just consuming Mm. without regard. And so, you know, to set the scene, I was there living in a squat with a few very um, questionable characters, just like myself at that point. Uh, and you could do, I, I like to say it was like a den of thieves or a den of vampires. It pretty much we didn't, I certainly didn't rise during the day. It was all about nighttime prowling and everything that goes with that. And a series of events that culminated into a spiritual awakening of sorts where I had a, a very much a breakdown spiritually more than anything else, as well as mentally. I was, I was pretty much out there. And just shortening that whole story, because that's a story in, in, in itself, mm-hmm. the, the reasoning, the, the, the thought I had when I first kind of awoke, came out of the stupor, was I need to get out of here and I should buy a bicycle. I think I had a few uh, a few ducats to my name at that point, <laughs> and um, I decided to spend it all on a bike. Nice pedal bike, bicycle. And next thing I knew, I was on this journey, and um, 
the first obstacle was that I had to get out of the Czech Republic without a passport because I'd burnt my passport somewhere along the line of Whoa. being rebelling against <laughs> who knows what. You decided you were a citizen of nowhere. I had no identity. You know, I can't explain the reason now, but I'm sure it was a very valid reason at the time. Uh-huh. Maybe in, a little bit insane, throwing a little bit, bit a little sprinkle with a little bit of insanity. Mm. So I had to sneak out of the Czech Republic through the forest border of Austria, which formerly was, you know, Cold War border. So there was machine gun turrets and barbed wire, and I somehow managed to sneak out with a bicycle. <laughs> What color was the bicycle? It was a silver and yellow mongoose. So it kind of stood out on yeah. the... Oh, yeah, clearly. <laughs> it looked like a wasp. It wasn't camouflage. No, it certainly wasn't a, a, a military spec bike. <laughs> and I found myself driving or riding to Vienna, where there was an embassy that had uh, the ability to reissue a passport. So that was the first port of call. And then I went... You know, I was um, following, at that point, I was more of, living a more of an alternative lifestyle, you could say. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was following the Rainbow Gatherings. Okay. Don't know how familiar with the Rainbow Gatherings you are or people listening, but they are, or were, they still are, like a burning man without an electricity. Mm. And there was a lot of hippies and a lot of, you know, earth worshippers, you could say, and medicine people and musicians and storytellers and all manner of folk and every mid midsummer for a for one full moon to the next there was a european gathering hmm. and they do it in the united states and other countries as well and they still do it now yeah i believe so i haven't yeah, been to one in, in many years i like the so, sound of it yeah they're great no electricity you know yeah. everything's based around fire there's raw food kitchens and you know healing areas and Live music and oh, and most and incredible and music. Yeah. Just around any fire on any given night, there was like you could you could find the tablas playing with a didge, playing with a mandolin, wow. beautiful singing. You could, it was just, you know, that part of it was just beautiful. Just so much creative energy. And people were coming together to share. And the premise was uh, no electricity and no hard drugs. You know, Simple. and one or two other rules, but it was pretty loose. And there was a talking stick that would go around, and that's how you make decisions and all the wiser members of the rainbow community. So anyway, I was on my way to Slovenia to a rainbow gathering in the forest of Slovenia. On the bike. On the bike. So I had a purpose, somewhat. <laughs> a short-term one. Short-term. And I had a didgeridoo attached to my bike. I made a little rack for it. And I had a drum that I'd made. So I was busking along the way. Um, and I made it to Slovenia, to the gathering and spent a beautiful month there, camped, multiple different campsites, because I didn't really have much with me on the bike. I think I, had a, uh, I think I had a hammock, a journal, and like the clothes I was wearing, one or two other possessions, you know what I mean? Like I said, a didge and a drum, and probably a hat. I think I definitely had a hat. Because <laughs> at that point, actually, I, I wanted to be more like an elf. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good I aspiration. This, I had this dream to be like, Straight out of a Tolkien was it novel. A, was it a wizard hat? It kind of was a little bit pointed. I think it was a Peruvian uh, knitted oh, yeah. pointed hat. I like Peruvian hats. Or could it be a felt hat? I don't entirely remember, but I knew I had a hat. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm, I've worn many different hats in this lifetime, so that's just one of many. And so I um, had a beautiful month camped in, a, in and around this beautiful glade, teepees and kids and just good vibes. Lots of love. And I met a crew from Israel, who were the rainbow crew from Israel, who invited me to the rainbow gathering in Israel, in the south of Israel, in the Negev desert. And I was, why not? I have some family there and I have kind of a genetic lineage that that, um, stretches stretches there. So I thought, oh, why not, you know? And so after the rainbow gathering, I started (laughs) pedaling. Furiously. <laughs> this is like uh, it's like Forrest Gump's story. Yeah, I've got a great image in my mind. Bike. Dispersed <laughs> with uh, lots of colorful adventures. Yeah, you know, I, do, I you know, it's one of those things in life. You remember those very clear moments. Like I remember riding through a field of sunflowers in Slovenia. Beautiful. In the summertime, you know, and next to a river, and just fo- following this meandering this river, and this old 
water mill, you know, just little flashes of that. And then I remember, you know, going down towards Croatia, but the war was happening. So this was 92 mm. or 93, mm. sorry. And getting out of there when I'm listening to, you know, the rat -tat 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 of machine gun fire wow. at night and going back through Slovenia into Italy. And I remember having the most delicious bowl of pasta in Trieste. Mm. And my intention was to ride through Italy. But then I met this interesting group of, they were Christian missionaries who were on a mission to Albania to build an orphanage and a church, I think. You know, and I thought, you know, why not? These seem like nice enough people, you know, team up. I can build. Safe in numbers, right? I can't really build. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely could not but build. I, I, like, you know, I'm, I'm willing to learn how to build. So I followed them and then pretty, pretty quick sharp, I realized how square they were. Uh, yes. And I wasn't really interested in the whole There's package. No vibe. Yeah, the package wasn't my package. Yeah. But you know, I, I bid them farewell and I got on my way. And at about that time, I met a Spanish guy who's riding around the world on a bike and we kind of teamed up briefly. Um, did I mention I, we took a boat to Albania? No, you didn't. Okay, so we took a boat to Albania from Trieste to Tires or Tirana, the capital of Albania. And Al Albania had never factored onto my radar, ever. It wasn't a place that I was like, hey, summer holidays in Albania. Mm. Especially in 93, right after the kind of the wall had come down and communism had evaporated not high on the list no but i um oh i also had a the beginnings of a pretty bad staph infection so i had this blood infection which was starting to materialize on my body as these boils excuse me <clears throat> so i just knew that it was a good idea to go to the ocean i just felt this great pull to the ocean you know the healing quality of the the salt and the sun and the you know, the, the breeze and, you know, what, what the ocean has, like a health farm of sorts, you mm -hmm. could say, but, you know, the most natural one there is. And I just knew that that was a positive for me, like being on the bike, sweating, you know, and irritating this infection I had anyway. I don't want to bore you with details about an infection, <laughs> but I wasn't healthy. You know, I was, in a sense, detoxing as well. A lot of toxins were coming out. I was kicking a habit. And had you stopped using it? I point? had. Yeah. I had cold turkey pretty much. You've just been, so you, all the while you're on the bike, you're just going through cold turkey? I'm just pretty much just, wow. just uh, yeah, coming up the other side of a, a habit. So I ended up, you know, wasn't comfortable through Albania. It was a pretty forlorn, desolate country in my memory. It was like along the coast, there was all these machine gun turrets from the Cold War days where they thought they were going to be invaded. And so I was like, sleeping in this machine gun turrets to stay out of the weather. And <laughs> I could find them on Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've probably done them up by now and figured out. Gentrified yeah. gun turret. <laughs> this is how real life used to be. <laughs> Come and experience the 90s. <laughs> so I couldn't actually wait to get out of Albania, to be honest. It was like a very foreign land with a very distinctly different language and not much food. Mm. So there was like bread, which is buch. And I remember another word, tungnyateta, which means hello and goodbye. My two words in Albanian. So long story short, I was able to ride through Albania through a series of pretty wild events. I think I shared briefly about this experience I had. This might be a little nice little segue where I was questioning what I was doing in Albania. You know, why Albania? You know, and... I was riding my bicycle up these switchback trails up through the mountains because I you know, decided to go towards the coast, but the coast met the mountains anyway. And I've come to this beautifully abundant fig tree where I have pulled over and decided to just gorge myself on figs. And am I off topic here, guys, or are we all good? No, you carry on. <laughs> I'm, I'm, with you. I'm with you in the figs. Okay, wonderful. You're a... a a fig aficionado. <laughs> I love fig a fig, fig me. <laughs> so I'm gorging on figs, and I'm in need of the nutrition and in need of the sustenance. And it was another one of those memories where I just had, like, fig juice just dripping down my face, and I was just satiated. And I, I fell asleep. I fell asleep next to the fig tree, next to my bike, without really any cares in the world. I was just content, belly full, you know, relatively warm under a tree, in the shade, 
overlooking this valley. It was a pretty idyllic little moment. Next thing, I'm in a lucid waking dream where I come out of this sleep state and I'm like awake and I'm looking around and I look at myself and I'm covered in armor. And I've got like a tunic on and a leather breastplate and kind of leather, almost a mini skirt. There's probably a technical name for that. Mm -hmm. If you're a Roman legionnaire. And I had a little short sword and I had this plumed helmet on. And I'm looking at myself going, I look like a Roman. I am a Roman. <laughs> and uh, I, I um, had this very powerful waking experience of seeing myself as some kind of Roman soldier. And I remember looking into the valley and there was an old settlement, or it wasn't old in my dream. It was, there was a settlement there, it seemed to be a market day, it seemed to be bustling and there was action going on and I'm just observing this and I realize, you know, I'm dreaming or I had that realization of snapping out of this dream and I wake up and I, I'm not wearing leather tunic anymore or armor, but I do see the valley and there's like abandoned ruins. There's these ruins in the bottom of the valley. And it was very real for me. And I almost felt like the whole purpose of being in Albania on one level, other than, you know, having some adventures and experiences mm -hmm. was to have this waking dream. Who's to say? In any case, I was pretty much off on my way. <clears throat> then um, was able to get out of Albania into Greece. And Greece was like coming back into the first world. There were street lights and straight roads and tarmac and, you know, people who spoke English. And, um, you know, more adventures along the way through the Greek islands where I, my intention was to go to the island they filmed the big blue on, mm. Amorgas, mm -hmm. which I've, I've, it's a beautiful movie. Stunning. Wonderful cinematography and just that evokes the, the magic of, you know, a, a, a lost time and free diving and the simplicity of, you know, the ocean and ocean, ocean hermits and dwellers. Anyway, I got, I got off on the wrong island. Ah. So I could see Amorgas in the distance, <laughs> but I was on this island called Dinosa where I, it was beautiful. It was just like a Morgas, but different name, except it didn't have a monastery up on the hills and it was an awesome. And I stayed there for a month and healed myself of this staff, pretty much just <clears throat> cleansed myself in the ocean, in the sun, in the wind. I had a f like a few shekels with me or a few drachmas, I think at that mm -hmm. point in Greece. And I was able to catch some fish. Somehow I got the spear gun off these French guys. I don't exactly remember. And I was catching some fish, swapping them for like, stone fruit in the village and eating Greek salads and kind of starting to feel a little bit more whole, a little mm. bit more in my body. And the sea, the ocean was definitely a big part of that healing, you know. And I it, found throughout my life when I've been away from the ocean, I've tended to, to be less, I wouldn't say balanced, but you know, I don't know what it is, maybe less fulfilled, maybe something like that. Was this your first realization of that on this this adventure your connection to the sea your healing connection to the sea no i definitely grew, as a youth we go to hawaii my father we used to run the marathon in on honolulu and at christmas time and i discovered the hawaiian pacific ocean and it's just beautiful over there you know mm. on so many levels just there's a different energy in the ocean in hawaii and i think that's the first time i really connected with my love of the ocean mm. in a way. I've always loved water and the ocean since I was a very young kid. In fact, I used to oftentimes snorkel and have my flippers on in the bath. <laughs> and then my mom would also say I would fall asleep in bed with a snorkel and mask on and flippers. <laughs> so I seem to always have that affinity. But to answer your question, it definitely was a, an awakening where I definitely did experience a different level of healing from the ocean. Mm. And just the knowing that that was what I needed Mm -hmm. And just following that and following through with it. So how many miles do you think you did on this trip? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be. Many. You, you've gone from Eastern Europe to uh, Croatia, to Italy, then back across. Albania. Albania, yep. that's north. Down to the border of Greece, through yeah. Greece, through the islands. I, I got out at Crete and Rhodes, and then, like I said, Donosa and Naxos. Yeah. And from Rhodes, went to Cyprus, and then Cyprus, Israel. And this is all without a passport? 
No, no, I, I had got I, I got a passport right. at that point in Fine. Vienna. Right. Vienna had an Australian embassy. Ah, they good. didn't have one in Prague. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Plus, I was, I, you know, I was into sneaking across the border under barbed wire fences for the pure By that adrenaline time. adventure of it. Another adventure. <laughs> so, so through that whole process, obviously you're you're taking yourself through early stages of recovery. Yep. Did it get easier with this? experience that you were having immersed in the nature on a bike not in a car you know taking in all the fresh air the vitamin d the like but by the sounds of it you weren't you didn't exactly have a, a nutritious diet but was do you think your healing process in that regard was improved upon by by the environment mm, good question being extracted or being repositioned into a place that I didn't know. So the triggers weren't the same. And I wasn't around the same people that I was before who were also triggers in a sense. And you know, privy and party to everything that I was doing. Definitely made it, I mean, easy is not the right word, but easier <laughs> mm. to not struggle mm. with wanting to get high. But I had before this fact actually been to rehab before and been indoctrinated in a sense by mm. the recovery language yeah. and around the recovery people and in, in essence exposed to the 12 steps. Right. It was a 12 steps retreat. Yeah. Well, it was a 12 step rehab. Yeah. And so I had experienced that and I had experienced some level of recovery where I'd, I had changed. But the under, underlying reality for me is I hadn't given up, hadn't surrendered, mm. hadn't really had a an awakening of sorts where I really had no doubt that I was, you know, I had a problem. Mm. So in a sense, yeah, it, it was, it gave me a buffer zone. It gave me time and it gave me uh, a positive physical habit or a positive f physical activity, obviously being on a bicycle and pedaling every day. Mm. And, you know, like they'd say, when you give up smoking, take up a, a hobby, right? Well, yeah. in a sense, that I, I replaced, I still had a mad brain or a mad head, you know, that hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. But I think as far as having a little bit of a buffer zone, yes, I think it was, it was very beneficial. Well, I guess you, in a way, you replaced using with adventuring, which is a pretty awesome thing to replace. Absolutely. Alcohol with. From one second to the next, literally. Yeah, I, uh, when I, I think I'd been clean and sober a year when I came to Bali, or just maybe a little bit over a year. But I have to say, actually having left London, moving to Bali, literally deleting my phone book pretty much and starting again, that, that really helped me. The, the environmental change was, was profoundly helpful, notwithstanding the fact that it was Bali and Bali is Bali, yep. obviously the, the home of healing and so on and so forth. But I, I, it helped me not to be in the environment, the same environment and with, some of the same people who were enabling me and of course whom I was enabling not to um, shirk responsibility we were all co-responsible for what we were doing so I suppose that does make a it does make a huge change environment and maybe sunshine as well I was ready I, I think the you know the baseline experience for me I'd, I'd proven to myself without a shadow of doubt that you know, that was not my path. You know, I have, I, I imbibe substances in a way that isn't beneficial for anyone, especially myself. And I have this, you could call it a sickness of sorts, where it's threefold. There's a physical allergy, there's a, a mental twist and obsession, and there's a spiritual disconnection. You can even take the word spiritual out of that and just put disconnection, you know. And the flip side of that, you know, when you look at the solution, it's like fellowship in a way of being around like-minded people or being in an environment that's positive and healthy and healing. Initially to start with, because I think once you go past those, that place and you become one, you, you're able to help other people, it doesn't matter where you go. Yeah. And then also the, um, the physical aspect of it, of really not having any control of if you have one or a thousand, you know, so it's like that, the idea of craving. So 
So yeah. I can relate. Yep. How long did the, I'm going to go back to your adventure a little bit here. How long did that take you to get all the way down to Israel? Approximately three months. Nice. So I imagine there's a lot more stories. Oh, within there's those so three many months. along that journey. <laughs> you know, just, I was just thinking this morning about, you know, how beautiful it is living in Bali and in, 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 in Indonesia as well on the whole, that you have a lot of, you know, this, these people have this idea that it, it is one of the biggest Muslim countries on the planet, if not the biggest, maybe most populated. And there's a lot in the West who consider that, you know, it's like we don't, you just don't, Islam is painted in a, a very specific brushstroke by many people. And it's, there's a massive generalization made. And what I've found to be the truth is we have some of the most incredibly friendly and giving people that I've experienced in Indonesia. And they tend to come from very poor backgrounds and very humble people from humble beginnings who will give you the shirt off their back. And so I experienced that in Albania at one point where I was, I cheated a little bit. I got on a train. What? Sorry. Oh man. But I felt like <laughs> Jack Kerouac. Illusion. I remember clearly I like had my, my feet dangling over the edge. I was like in a cattle car with the door open, just, nice. you know, just chugging along there. And there was this, this moment where this Albanian man, we started communicating, not talking because I didn't understand anything he was saying and he didn't understand anything I was saying, but we were communicating using sign language. and. I got his name, his name was Castriot. I remember that. And Castriot invited me back to his house to sleep in his house and to eat. And I couldn't say no. And so, you know, I went back to his house and he lived in literally a hovel, like, you know, a very, very basic favela type of environment. And he had like one little bed and his family, his whole family slept on the bed and they offered me the bed and they wouldn't take no as an answer. And I felt really uncomfortable and they cooked and I ate with them. And I just had this incredible experience of human connection, mm. you know, and you know, the beauty of it. So yeah, I had many experiences. And you know, when you, when you look back and think about the, these adventures that I have, that we have, that we all, sh you know, can talk about in our lives and we pinpoint moments. You know, it's interesting what comes to mind. Because I was just thinking about that this morning, about the, the goodness of, of humans' hearts, mm -hmm. you know, and how we get tainted, or some societies more than others, by more, mm. you know, and, you know, disconnection. And the pursuit of more, and the pursuit of things that arguably aren't really all that useful for us. I had a, a similar situation to that which you mentioned. I was in the... Amazon, in the Brazilian Amazon, a couple of years ago, uh, and I was a guest of the Noke Quinn tribe, the Katukina, and uh, they're down. The, all of the tribe, the tribe, the Noke Quinn is is kind of broken up over villages all the way up this huge road. You know, I don't know if you've been around that part of the world, but it's huge. And I went to stay with this uh, cacique, who's the the chief and the page, the shaman. We'd been doing some work with plant medicine up in Peru, in the Sacred Valley, and it was time for them to go home. My buddy, the shaman, said, I'm going to take the guys back to the village. You want to come? Yeah, why not? Hopped in a car and drove for, I don't know, two or three days, eventually landed in this, in this village. And they, I, these days, the, the Amazonian tribes, or this particular tribe anyway, they're not, they're not that backward. They've got wooden huts, uh, ironically, you know, still no showers and so on and so forth, but everyone's got a smartphone, which is kind of crazy. Mm. But they have to go to a certain little tower, a satellite tower thing, in which all the villages use so they can use Wi Fi. It's kind of a bizarre setup. But I remember specifically being invited by the cacique to sleep in his house. So myself and my buddy are in the two main bedrooms. And it only occurred to me halfway through this week. That these there are only three bedrooms in this house where's he sleeping and i found out later on he was actually sleeping on a porch like at the end of the village and he'd given up his bedroom for us mm. and same thing i couldn't understand a word these guys were saying but um, the connection we had was profound yeah, and there's nothing wrong with more <laughs> no with with you know with consciousness in the sense of like obviously you know we need to i, I we i 
I say we, we need to do our things and there's nothing wrong with having abundance. And at the same time, I think that's got in the way of that. It, it not, not always, but it's got in the way of that connection yes. with people. You know, the simple, simple service of being of service or being of this in the service mentality on the mindset, you know, just look at our current state of affairs and see, you know, it's just like people are benefiting from other people's misfortune, misfortune, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and that's clear as day Yeah, for all to see if you're willing to take a look at it. Yeah, I think that's probably the one of the most sad things. But it seems to be a reality of, of, of history. It's a reality of, of humankind. Yep. All that said, I genuinely feel as though we're turning a corner and I genuinely feel as though our collective consciousness is, is very much shifting. Interesting. <laughs> right? To think the plan has backfired. Yeah. On some levels and yeah. other levels, maybe it was preordained. And actually loads of people woke up, so, and there are lots of people are doing their work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump forward to um, you coming to Bali and you co-founded Drifter Surf Shop and Cafe. Yes. It's much more than a surf shop. I mean, it's... As a mecca to the surfing Absolutely. community and to those of us that don't surf that would aspire to become a surfer but currently are not there it makes me want to be a surfer <laughs> every time i walk into jake's shop i'm like oh man look at these surfboards yeah. they're so lovely yeah. wonderful but it's, yeah. it's a creative and cultural immersion space and to us it feels like home and we've mentioned that to you before and i i think you know you kind of aspired to have that that sense of home from home um but obviously we want to talk a little bit more about drifter in a moment but what and initially drew you to Bali? The waves. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Sorry, I'm very superficial. That was poetically but the, timed. You know, I, I, I came here first time with my family in 1974 when I was just one. So I just dated myself. And my mum and dad used to come here in the 60s. And so I'd, I think it was just in my psyche and then I remember my sister on a year off from, from school before university, she sent a postcard back in the day when we used to write postcards and letters. Mm -hmm. And she was in Bali and she just talked about this magical, mystical island with puppet shows and magic. And it just, it just was very evocative and provocative for me. And I just had this moment where I just almost had a knowing that I was going to live here. I just had this inner knowing and so when i finally did come here and got off the plane at the airport as a as an adult i just knew i was home mm. i just knew that this was the place for me may it be the smell of incense wafting may it be the the hectic traffic situation may it be the the, the, the clove cigarettes and the the barley coffee or may it be the waves or Probably the, the biggest thing is the people and the allure of this magical community, magical island full of, you know, wonder. Mm. Much, much more. That just scratches the surface, right? I've never been anywhere else in the world where people smile the way the Balinese mm. smile. Yeah, I've been around. Mm. Probably not as much as you by the sounds of it. And certainly not on a bike. But... <laughs> But the Balinese... I retired that bike. <laughs> By the sounds of it, you ran it into the ground. It, yep. <laughs> it retired itself. But Typical I, proportions. But I think, I think the Balinese have a beautiful, beautiful energy about them. And it's so natural for them as well, isn't it? It's, it's, no, it's simple. And just a wonderfully creative island on so many levels. I mean, you can look historically and they say the Majapahit Empire migrated islam came through to java and things started to change and a lot of the artisans and the creatives and the you know priestly classes migrated to bali and so that's its underpin but i would say even prior to that this, this island's magic it just has this incredible yeah. je ne sais pas <laughs> well it's the energy isn't it and it, but of course energy. it's on it's it's on global ley lines yeah um, we were reading about this the other day, weren't we? The, it's, yeah, about the, one of the portals, isn't the it? The energy portals around Bali. Mm -hmm. There's one up near us in Agung. There's one down here at uh, Ulu Temples, probably in your back garden. Definitely, yep. 
Where's the other that. one? There's another one, maybe Ubud. I think likely. I mean, it feels like the whole island is activated on. Yeah, sure. and most people tell you, don't they, that they were drawn to Bali. Like something told them mm. to come to Bali, and yeah. you just you listen. Yeah. Eventually. Well, look, everyone who everyone who is drawn here has a, an amazing story to tell. Yeah. Yeah. And the creative, like, like, like the creative capacity and ability to create is amplified here for me. And I think a lot of other people, we can feel the same way about that. So totally. the incarnation of Drifter on some levels is an expression of that creativity. A combination of lifestyle, passion, hobbies, sharing, community, was born out of that need to have a space like that. For me and for, I feel, others too, you know? Like a, I like to, I like to, I see myself as as I'm a lighthouse builder, you know, not trying to blow a trumpet, but I like to see that as a, a way to just create more light in this world or be a part of that movement, and so Drifter in a, in a way is an offering, and at the same time a viable business and a place to you know, to experiment and have fun. Well, of course, we, so we saw you last night because we have become regular attendees at your Cosmic Whale event, which is also at Drifter. I, I wonder if you want to talk about that for a minute because I would love for, for people to listening at home all around the world to, to track some of these down because you do sure. film them, don't you? Sure, we've, we've, we've been engaging with the Cosmic Whale f over the last six months or so. It's been a, a project in this time. And it is a storytelling event, which we invite storytellers to share, you know, true tales told live, as we put it, and share stories of trials and tribulations, triumphs and, you know, s failures, you could even say, and, and just life stories and sharing and connecting and inspiring and maybe warning. And we've been having, positive success well, a lot of people have been loving it they're brilliant and, and the th there's a theme of course for for the whole thing yes so the theme in, in essence is a point in your life after which you were never the same maybe almost what we're talking about today where you know you have these incredible revelations or you have seemingly you know horrible thing happen that turns into a blessing and you know everyone's got a story like that on some level so in a way it's it's also sharing those stories and knowing how to time them and have a beginning, a middle, and the end. It's very similar to The Moth. Some people are familiar with The Moth, which was a storytelling event started in New York where they, where they share exactly that, you know. So I was inspired. I've been inspired by many people, obviously, and by many different circumstances. But when I was in Prague, there was an English character who I, and he was from... I believe he was from Manchester, but I don't entirely remember. And he was a barrister, one of those proper wig-wearing barristers who dress up in the black and whites and go, go to court. And he had a bit of a spiritual awakening and he decided to chuck in the job as a barrister and become a, a bard. Nice. Yeah, to become a bard. And That's a the, difference in income. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. And clothing. Yeah. He basically chucked in the job and bought a harp and started learning bardic <laughs> stories. And the bardic tradition Love that. Is, a, you know, is an ancient Celtic tradition where these, these bards have to learn X amount of stories. And it's almost like you know, Joseph Campbell, the, the, the Way of the Warrior, where you're learning these archetypes. All these stories are related to that, you know, the heroine and the, 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 the girl and the dragon and the, you know, the, the king and the, you know, the joker and you know, the, the love story. It's these classic archetypal stories. Yeah. And so this guy, his name was Dorje, or Thunderbolt. And he had this purple cloak with you know, stars and moons and other things kind of in, in, emblazoned on it and a, and a pointy hat and a carpet. And he used to set up on the bridge in Prague, Carl's Bridge, and roll out this carpet and have a magic hat there just, you know, in case people wanted to donate. And he'd tell stories with his harp. And, you know, you'd, you'd sit on this carpet with him and just be transported into a different time and place and space. And it always struck me. There was this barrister who became a bard on the bridge. 
in Prague telling stories about dragons and princesses. And, and he was as content of a person as I've ever met. And I just really respected that. It was like an old tradition that in our society, in many ways, we've forgotten. Yeah. Because we use these, you know, these boxes called, the, you know, television. And it's a very different type of programming. So the cosmic whale, in a sense, is, is definitely a sharing and a community building experience and much, much more, you know, a topic of discussion. Yeah, in the community. And, yeah. I, and I think that's another wonderful thing you've done is, I think it's safe to say that Drifter is very much at the center of the Uluwatu community anyway. You've been here for a long, long time and you, and you are a Mecca, you are that lighthouse. But, but I, th I think certainly from what, what I've experienced, we've experienced going and talking to other people it's a wonderful opportunity for us all to check out of our own stories and just check into others. And I think the other lovely thing about it is it's a wonderful reminder that every one we see and meet is going through something. We don't know it. We have no idea. We might have a fleeting introduction to that person. It might just be a smile or it might just be a scowl. But actually everyone's going through something. And what I love about the cosmic whale is that people stop and spend 25 minutes telling us one of those stories, one of those things that's driven them. And of course, stories of transformation. Mm. Isn't it? Awesome. So, such a diverse group of people you've had so far. So we've got it on YouTube. Unashamed plug here. <laughs> Drifter Surf has a YouTube channel. Do it. And there's a Cosmic Whale channel. So if you're interested in hearing some of the stories, you can plug in there. Mm. That is a worthwhile plug. And uh, there is a link to the Drifter website also on uh, howtodiehappypodcast.com forward slash on dash the dash show. And you will find a, a very fetching photo of Jake with <laughs> naught but some swimmers and a giant surfboard. Ah, you use that picture. Click on that one and you'll get to the website and where well, you can find him all over the internet. Am I wearing a wig? No, but okay, we, we need to use that one. one. <laughs> a po we wanted to make it portrait, and right, we couldn't right. get the context of the surfboard in there. It just right. looked like you were in the water with a wig. and just Perfect. <laughs> kind of didn't do the job. So here you are in Bali, living the good life. So I'm going to hit you up with a big question. Mm, Uh-oh. What does happiness mean to Jake? Mm. Happiness. Yeah, that is a big question, isn't it? Oh, no, yeah. the interesting thing about this whole two-year period is how one evaluates our footprint on this planet or, in a sense, I suppose, doing medicine journeys, you, you, you understand the, the imprint that we're making on the planet and how we're impacting everyone around us and you know the earth and so to answer that question i would have to say i feel most happy when i'm helping other people you know i think talking about spirituality for lack of a better word it's like spirit so lifting someone else's spirit you know and I think that uh, for me recently, I've been engaged more and more with working with other people less fortunate than myself and really feeling more purposeful. That there's no ulterior motive other than it actually makes me feel really good. Yeah. And um, it's a natural high in a sense of, you know, really having a purpose. And I do that with other recovering people. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, in a sense, if you talk about the 12 steps, is the 12th step. Uh, and it doesn't need to be. It's the premise of many spiritual traditions of being of service, of taking actions and not being attached to the results. Easier said than done. Mm -hmm. I'm not speaking from any high place here because I certainly am still very human and have my frailties and foibles. But when I do engage in service, and that can also mean doing the dishes. <laughs> But, you know, I don't want to get caught in the weeds here. It's more along the lines of happiness, it, for me, equates to doing my best to be of service to those around me. And you've been clean and sober 26 years? Yep, yes. So when did you, when did you get to the 12th step and then begin 
uh, regularly practicing service to others. You can get to the 12th step in, in the first few weeks you're sober. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there is no, they do, they do have them in, in, in a numbered sequence for a reason, but you can go from step one to step 12. You know, there's nothing that's is stopping anyone from, by helping other people as you're helping yourself, essentially. For sure. You know? But you can't give away something you don't have. So in a sense, it's like the experience of, you know, let's just say somebody's struggling today with just not having a drink. Mm -hmm. And you happen to be okay today because you've done a few things. And so therefore, the ability to practice the 12 step is available. You know, I don't think there's, like the beautiful thing about that, the, that particular program is, no one's on a pedestal, although we're humans and we put people on pedestals and anyone is available to be of service to anyone else who's a little bit less fortunate than, mm. than them. Mm -hmm. So for me, straight away. I have to say, when, when I first did some voluntary work at a, a rehab, that was because I, as you know, I didn't follow the 12 step process. My sobriety journey was an alternative one. It, it did involve therapy, yeah. so it involved traditional therapy. Although, ironically, we weren't discussing my alcoholism and, and addiction at that point. We were discussing the roots, not the symptoms, which, as I realized, as I later realized, was, was exactly what I needed to hear and what I needed to do. But, but for me, actually, plant medicine was, and, and meditation and yoga were and breath work were the sort of main things that that uh that helped me get through my final cravings and pangs and and plant medicine as you likely know for some people can have a profound effect on addiction completely changes the way our our, our brain works and, and does some of that root work that, 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 that fixes the the broken psyche but i i did a i did a short stint working uh, as a volunteer and man, you know, that's the rewarding stuff right there. Keeps isn't you it? grateful. That is the rewarding stuff. It just, I remember, I remember I'd, I'd, I'd done one session and I came away and I think I was talking to my brother and he said, how was, how was it? And I said, buddy, I've been working my nuts off for 25 years. I thought I was doing you know, great legendary stuff. It's just all been obliterated in 45 minutes I, and I've done the most worthwhile 45 minutes worth of work I ever did in my life yeah you're right great grateful comes into it because we this was this was people on the first the first step into the th into a 30-day 12-step program mm -hmm. so they were they were coming off planes drunk or or high because they knew anyone coming off a bicycle I don't think so. I think, he, I think he's top. I'm, I'm certainly not alone. I think you were alone in that regard, but but I would say unique, not so not alone. But yeah, these people are are absolutely in need of help, mm. and uh, and some didn't want help either. It was it, they reluctantly turned up to to the clinic because of course they were forced to by friends, family, or even employers. It was look, you either go to the rehab or we're having nothing to do with you anymore. So, yeah, so all power to you, man. It's, uh, well, I think that's common, like you mentioned it too, I think that combination of prayer, meditation, yoga, whatever it is, is definitely recharging the batteries and leveling out and then being of maximum service or, or you know, maximum service is probably a big, big call, but more available. Because I my meditation practice, I'm always going back to the, present mm. you know mindfulness being mm -hmm. here being now in the body with the feelings yeah understanding that the, i'm not this mind i'm not these thoughts i'm not this body i'm not this puppet yeah this story you know transcending that and being really available and present enables me to be more of service you, no doubt because you've you've got conscious awareness and some people haven't achieved that yet and it's a wonderful thing to be able to, that's one of the things we're trying to do with this podcast, essentially. We are trying to, to give people utilities, stories and practical utilities of, of how they might begin to do this work. Absolutely. Interestingly, I was reading, uh, rereading Gabor Mate's book in the realm of hungry ghosts, 
which I bought from your shop. Yes. <laughs> it's a tome. <laughs> it's, a, it's a genuine tome. That's massive. But he talks about um, Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz and UCLA's research. On the f and they created four steps. Mm. Remember all that? that was, I haven't read it in a while, but refresh. Well, essentially, it, the, the treatment was actually developed. The four-step program was developed to treat OCD. But they recognized the, the, the glaring similarities between OCD and addiction because, of course, you've got the obsessive behavior. And it's, it wasn't designed to replace the 12 steps. It's designed to complement it. But ha having read it, it feels quite like a good set of utilities. And I'm not going to read through all of them, but the four steps are relabel, reattribute, refocus, and revalue. I think you probably get a little mm. clue as to where that's going. Actually, Mate then added his own fifth step, which was recreate. Right. Which, in all due deference to uh, Dr. Schwartz, he, he wanted to just talk about, okay, once you've done all of that work, what's next? And funnily enough, we just, we're, we just recorded another podcast with your, our shared friend Alexander Mendeluk, where we were talking about once you've done the healing work, what is next? Because the intention is not that we spend our whole lives healing. <laughs> Fair enough, because a lot of us have spent our whole lives suffering, but the intention is to do the healing work and then move on to the stage of purpose, of finding purpose. Mm. And I think that's where, um, where Marte was going. But he, he said something really nice here, and I've just got to try and find the words we know that the addicted brain assigns a falsely high value to the addictive object substance or behavior the process called salience attribution the addicted mind has been fooled into making the object of your addiction the highest priority addiction has moved in and taken over your attachment reward and incentive motivation circuits where love and vitality should be addiction roosts and he goes on to talk about the dis distorted brain circuits but essentially the point and purpose of these steps is to enable the addict to engage with conscious awareness and then to be pragmatic about their story ergo it is you are not your story you are the result of faulty brain circuits which may or may not have been created in your first year, first eight years, the, the formative years. So he does a wonderful job in, in promoting the concept of what Buddhists would call mindfulness. Mm. So 20 years ago, 26 years ago, yes. when you began your sobriety journey, we in the West weren't talking about mindfulness. We, I imagine, were talking more about higher purpose, Jesus, God. And so I wonder how your journey has transformed from beginning the 12 steps talking about God and a higher power to, to, to now practicing mindfulness. Yeah, okay. The first thing that comes to mind is the longer I'm doing it, the less I know. <laughs> same goes for life <laughs> yeah and so i've been stripping away like you were saying more of those frames that have been imbued inside my process and dismantling the understandings and simplifying and re-simplifying and re-addressing and you know and in the last few years, my meditation practice has become much more front and center in the sense of I really appreciate what it brings into my existence for relationships with everyone around me, my wife, my kids, my friends, the people I work with, all animals, you know, the list goes on. So mindfulness in a sense is a word that might be more hip or more, um, you know, used. But I think 
the, the ancients from the from however long we've been on this planet practicing, you know, being human, hmm. you know, you see many different beings talking about the same thing with a different language, perhaps. So the base note, base line of the 12 <clears throat> step fellowships that is, in my understanding, is they are from a Judeo-Christian, Christianic viewpoint in the sense that they were created in the last century um, and they were created in a Western environment, in the Western world, which is primarily Judeo-Christianic. You know, obviously Islam features in, in the East more. And so that is the, the reference, that's the language, that's the base note. But underneath it, the real language is all about it's broad, roomy, and all-inclusive. You know, it is walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. Whatever language you say that, and it makes no difference what belief system or verbiage or words you use. It's an ancient way of connecting as humans. And that is my understanding of the 12 steps. It is a way to have a relationship with spirit yeah and therefore have a relationship with people and it it bypasses any language and any bounds and any belief systems and so bringing it back to the mindfulness you know when i realize on a daily basis sometimes second by second that i'm not my thoughts that i'm not my mind and as i said i'm not this puppet jake you know i'm much, much more, but also, you know, it it brings me to another understanding of who am I? Mm. <laughs> the the, you the know, question. The, that's the question. That That's the one we can keep going back to time yeah. and time again. Yeah. But I suppose the point is you're asking that question, and that's the distinction. Yeah, we, we talked about this on a recent, you know, the recent episode, the idea that actually all of these things we're talking about all of these modalities and techniques and methods of healing do all come down first and foremost to having the ability to exercise pure awareness and i can't remember the name of this doctor i don't know if he's a quantum healing doctor but i listened to a couple of his meditations he does a meditation called a pure awareness technique and it's a guided meditation, so you go through it and he asks you to, to be aware of all sorts of things. Be aware, you obviously, you've got your eyes closed, you're aware of your arms, your legs, your chin, your whatever, your, your, where you are in the room. And the, the trippy bit is, and obviously this is in early days in my journey, in my meditation. The trippy bit was when he said, are you aware of your awareness? Are you aware that you are aware? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> inception. Yes, I am aware that I'm aware. Wow. The observer. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And as you say, therefore, I am not my mind. Yeah. And I'm certainly not the voice inside my head. Wow. I don't quite know what that is. It's like a yellow submarine or something. Ah, yeah. Well, for, for the listeners, we are on a, an open terrace nestled in the cliffside on Bingham Beach with some big waves crashing and something yellow is floating toward <laughs> us. Looks like a submerged <laughs> kayak. Yeah, it looks like a kayak, boom. doesn't it? Many more of them <laughs> live next door. <laughs> yeah, so I, was, I was listening to a Wayne Dwyer meditation yesterday and he's talking about, from the biblical sense again, from the Torah, the, the, the name of God is I am that I am. Mm. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and then I think the Hindus have a very, I, I probably butcher this, but Tatsvat ta, Tam or Am, I forget what it is now, but you know, I am that I am. And I had the good fortune in 2019 to go to India to Ramana Maharishi's ashram in Arunachala. And I, I fell in love with him when I read a book. I've, I'd heard of him in passing over the years, but I read a book by Paul Brunton called In Search for Secret India or Sacred India. And in it, uh, Paul Brunton would go around these mystics in India and, you know, he went all over India. He was in the 30s, I think, or even the 20s, or maybe the, the 20s. 
And he finally came upon this, this character, Ramana Maharishi, who is sitting there under this mountain, Arunachala, in this beautiful ashram. And he hadn't spoken in many years, but he was surrounded by devotees who he taught in silence. And I always found that to be just mind-blowing, that all these people would sit at his feet and learn from him in silence. Just meditating? Or? Yeah, he was emanating. He was working with them in meditation. Wow, this. Okay. And I was, and I, and I went there, and I had a profound experience. I, yeah. in a sense, uh, w when I look at how I can dissect it and understand it from my three D mind perspective, I can't. Mm. But on another level, I look at it. I was in the grace. I was yeah. in this grace, where I was just like, almost in another frequency altogether. And he'd been, he's, had, he's left his body for decades, but his presence and effervescence and being is still very much available. So who was he? Who, you know, who am I, once again? And his famous meditation technique is self-inquiry, which simply says for the practitioner to simply inquire, who am I? Mm -hmm. Over and over again. In repetition. Until such time as you receive a response. Nice. Wow, so you, you just joined a number of devotees who were sitting in silence. You sat, you meditated. Does he work like a, a, sh like a shaman in that regard then, kind of dancing in, in and out of people's experience, in and out of their meditation? I can only speak about my experience, but sure. it was profound. I went to, I had... Uh, no real expectation of what was going to happen. I'd never been there before. And I discovered quite quickly a really beautiful rhythm where I was waking up at you know, 4.30 and I'd go sit in this meditation hall where he used to sit, you know, days, raised days, and in essence teach. And stone walls, very, very rootsy, very rustic, Indian. And I sat against this wall and I would just sit in meditation and just... The quiet and the peace was palpable. Mm. So there was just this incredible, peaceful energy pervading everything. And then there was a window, and I would, would feel the light starting to rise. And then right as the light started to rise, there was this chanting that came from the main hall with all the women doing this beautiful chant. So just women's voices singing this ancient, I don't, don't, don't know the... the the translation of what they were singing, but it was this most sublime, beautiful harmonic chant. And then you would just pull like bees to the honey. And then I'd go out to this main hall and just sit and listen in meditation. And then they would do a morning puja where they would go around and, you know, by the end of the puja, by that time they blessed that the Bhagwan was buried underneath this main stage. So he was interned under the ground. They built this beautiful temple above him. And the priest would go and bless the milk and the, you know, the sweet fruit. And then you would go around and you'd take prashad or you'd receive this blessed fruit, similar to what they do in Bali. And then, you know, you get the doti on the third eye and you've been blessed. And that was by like 7.30 in the morning. So by 7.30 in the morning, I was flying. Wow. And you had the whole day. <laughs> and, and then, and then what the, and then... Generally speaking, what we do is I, I went there with a friend of mine who's another meditator from Sydney, Pete. We'd go across the road and sit in the chai shop with all the Indians and just sit there and sip chai. And generally, we weren't hungry. We might have a little snack or something. And then we would go back into the ashram and climb up the mountain about a third of the way to a cave where the Bhagwan had lived for 20 years in silence where there was a story that a 13th century or 14th century sadhu had achieved moksha or enlightenment and he burst into flames and they made this lingam. You know, the lingam is the male, uh, as, as opposed to the yoni, the male um, penis <laughs> or the male form. And he'd cover this lingam in a sacred cloth and we would sit in that cave and sometimes meditate for hours. Mm -hmm. It would, it would almost slip by in seconds. And in this grace, in this energy, sitting in this cave, which had been meditated in for hundreds of years and lived in by Ramana Maharishi, who is no doubt an ascended, incredibly beautiful, powerful master. And you could not help 
but feel the grace, yeah. for lack of a better word, mm. or just the effervescence of the energy of what he exuded. And that was like 10.30 in the morning. Yeah. You know, so I did this for a few weeks. Nice. And by the end of it, really had the most remarkable experience. It's hard to, to define in words, but I think I just described to you kind of a, I think you a did morning a, practice. I think you did a wonderful job. You oh, it makes me want to go back to India. Yeah, yeah <laughs> me you too. Were, you were in an ashram. Yeah, I've spent, I spent quite a lot of time in India over the years. So yeah, I can re definitely um, relate to that experience, but not um, in such depth, actually. That sounds insane. It was simple. It was a routine, actually. It wasn't, it wasn't complicated. It was just like we just did the same thing because it was working. Mm -hmm. But then to go back out into the real world, or the real world, for lack of a better word, you know, I've, it was, it's a sweetness that I want to go back to. I can see why people want to be next to the guru or next to that ascended master or really mm -hmm. enlightened being who taught in silence. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know? And that brings me back to that thing with Paul Brunton. He sat and taught. And the stories about him, you know, people receiving incredibly profound insights and experiences in silence amazing yeah. i did the tapa brata yeah in uh, bali which is a seven day silent retreat and it's hosted by uh, uh, a healer very yeah a very powerful man beautiful man called pak murta Adda, and it's up in the jungle north of ubud and that was my first experience of 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 a silent retreat and i'm a chatty chap as you know, so it was also my first experience of any prolonged silence. And, and this was no books, no paper, no pens, obviously no technology. Uh, you, and I had to share a room with a couple of guys. And every day we were up with a gong at 4.30, straight into the meditation hall. And we just meditated or listened to his teachings for, for seven days. It was, it was a profound experience, not on the same level I think is being in the presence of the energy, the resonant energy of a holy man. Although Pat Murta is a Pat Murta cured his own liver cancer through his, through meditation. So this chap is a particularly powerful healer, and he teaches a certain type of meditation. But I have to say, when I finished that, I remember I had to get out of the country to reset my visa. So I had to get on my bike, shoot out through the forest. I had this wonderful ride through central Bali, you know, 50 shades of green and, and just laughing and crying the whole way and uh, interacting with the kids who were hanging out the backs of trucks. But then I had to go home, pack a bag, get to the airport and then go to Kuala Lumpur for a weekend, <laughs> you know, to reset my visa. My gosh, you're talking about going back to the real world. I was actually borderline depressed. I was supposed to stay there, stay there three nights stayed there one night, went back to the airport, bought a ticket and went back to Bali as quickly as I could because I, having experienced that silence and that serenity within, it was, uh, it was a, a nasty contrast to go back into the world. I suppose you have to take a little bit of like decompression and just compress back into it. Integration we call it, don't we? Integration, yeah. So after that, very briefly, I went on to Oroville, which is a community right outside Pondicherry. Yeah. Which is very, mind expanding and that's, incredible vision that's the huge um circular City. yeah where citadel. the dome is where the uh, old the, sacred geometry the golden yeah they have the meditation wow. space well, there's there is a name for it i forget it now but i also went to see the tomb of sri aurobindo and meditated at the tomb it was very similar mm. it was also once again a holy person's space so you could plus all the energy and it's the same as bali when all that energy and and prayer and power is put into something. It yeah. just creates its own energy. It stays, so, yeah. You've thousands of people doing that, if not millions of people. But Oroville was incredible. Well, it's, hearing your stories and hearing Jules' stories uh, prior to this many times, I, I have to say India's on my list. When, this, when, when, the, when the world calms down, India's on my list, I think, as a place I'd love to visit and, and go to an ashram and do some of this. Very frustrating country too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so it's I, got it all. It has it all. You, one day you love it, the next day you hate it. So I understand. Yeah. We've been rambling on and we haven't given any airtime at all to our Be My Guest section of the show. So as you know, we always offer you up as a, um, as a recipient 
to our listeners, and we have two questions for you today. Ah, okay. Be my guest. Let's talk, my friend. Let's talk, my friend. This is not the end. You are free. You just don't know it yet. Tread your wings. You just don't know it yet. Be my friend. There's more of that beautiful song. That's uh, beautiful. But I should probably just play the questions. <laughs> you don't have to. You can. Hi, this is Candace from California. My question is how to die happier in spite of the fact that I am not reconciled with a son who has a lifelong drug addiction. Wow, thank you, Candice. Wow. Big question. And I suppose we have different perspectives, don't we? Mm. Which is being a son as well. What you got? Well, that's that, Candice. That's a, that's a very uh, profound question. How to reconcile? I would 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 ask is to start with. Would Candice be in communication with her son, or is it um, purely a reconciliation from her in, inside herself? You know, I, I would have to say that uh, I have children. My children are still young, so I haven't experienced them in addiction. And, I, you know, knock wood, I hope I never do. I do have friends who struggle with their kids who are in addiction. And I know how much pain uh, it causes them in their heart. And obviously, you know, it's a really hard one because, you know, not that I would put out something on the party line and say, well, you know, go to Al-Anon and practice, you know, acceptance and, you know, and um, detachment because it's when, she, when it's your own children, obviously that's easier said than done. One tool that I use uh, is I meditate. And after I meditate, I say prayers. And in those prayers, I particularly pull in the faces of the people I'm praying for and about. And if I don't know their face and I just focus on their name, um, obviously you know your son. And in my prayer part of it, I you know, just send them love and send them light and send them healing in the sense of offering them up everything that would make their heart sing and would give them joy and happiness. And I feel in a way that's probably an answer for your son in the sense that you have no control over him. He has his own experience in life and in a sense his own understanding of a higher power or God or even if he doesn't believe in. And uh, therefore you, you have no power over him in any way other than the way you feel in your heart towards him which obviously as a mother you love your son and um, I don't know about reconciliation I think that's a big one but I feel that sending love and light and all the positive imagery that you can you can pull out and uh, give to your son you know and it will bring more peace to you and maybe will help him by lightening his burden, as opposed to sending him any negativity or um, darkness, which is easy to do, you know, being upset and angry and sad and fearful. Um, that's the other side. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. And I don't even know if it's about happiness. I think it's about acceptance and peace. And detachment in love so yeah i hope that helps candace i thought that was absolutely stunning advice jake mm. it brought some tears to my eyes there as well um actually alan watts almost he wrote a book about happiness and he almost called it the anatomy of acceptance in fact he did call it the anatomy of acceptance but the publishers said no we need a catchy title i think in accepting 
you can find a great deal of happiness. It's a, it's, uh, we don't know Candace's full story, do we? But I, I, I couldn't possibly say anything on top of what you just said. I, I, for me, it's, it's about sending love and light. That's all you can do. And if you don't have any contact with him, then at least you can have contact in that way. It might feel like it's one way, a one way signal, but that's okay as long as you're feeling that. And that's really all you can give him. So, mm. yeah, man. Epic response, Jake. Thank you. Came from my heart. Yeah, I felt that. Okay, question number two. Hi, Jake. Uh, the more time I spend in nature consciously, the more I recognize that there is an element of communication there you know, between whether I'm sitting consciously with a tree or a rock, etc. And I find that that's the times when I get the most clarity on, on certain aspects of my life. And I was wondering, as a surfer, whether you've had any sort of big moments of clarity or any kind of lessons learned or teachings, if you like, from the ocean. What a lovely question. Yeah, what a lovely, what a lovely <laughs> accent and voice. Mm. Yeah, great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, a few things spring to mind straight away and uh, yeah I love the ocean and I agree with you being in nature and being quiet in nature and being present and in the body and you know feet on the ground or in the water is a really recharging place for me as well and I appreciate it especially in meditation too and um, I have two little quick ones. Well, actually, no, I'll just focus on the one. I um, like to surf bigger waves. Um, and I'm very comfortable in more, you could say, treacherous uh, environments. I tend to be able to relax, which I find to be key, just really relaxing and um, breathing and centering and being calm. I think that's a very a prerequisite for surfing on bigger days. And I, for many years in Bali, used to attend what was, what was known as the Bali Spirit Festival, which was a, a festival of uh, lots of music and yoga and healing and community and food and workshops. It was wonderful. I used to have a product called Surf Yogis. Uh, it was a sunscreen made out of chocolate, basically. Anyway, that's another story. Mm -hmm. So I used, to go, that. Yeah, I used to go up there and, and uh, participate. And... It was about a week long, um, all in all, and I used to sleep. It was up in Ubud, which is kind of the home and center of yoga here in Bali. And, and after a week, uh, one year, I was feeling so plugged in and so calm and, in a sense, more feminine in my energy. I felt very, I don't know, more feminine. I was, it was, just seemed to be that way. Ubud has that, that tendency, and at that point, I was kind of like, that way more yin you could say and I've come back to Uluwatu where I live and I surf and Uluwatu had a very uh, a large swell there was there was massive waves you know when you gauge it there were 20 foot faces 25 foot faces even and I had this very calm centered demeanor I pretty much came off the mountain paddled straight out into these giant waves and I was just in the flow I just felt so in tune with the ocean and I was almost calling waves to me and I had a seamless session and it stands out in my mind because I was really uh, at peace. I was really balanced, I think, maybe not at peace. I was really balanced in my, you could even say the hemispheres were, were balanced and I was able to combine that real strong kind of yang male energy in a, in a, in a technically dangerous environment with this very calm relaxed flowing female energy and i was able to harness those both together and surf a, a beautiful session memorable to this day it was as if i was calling waves to me so i think that might answer in some ways it was more along the lines of it just being balanced i suppose um but yeah thank you for your question is is there a specific frequency to the waves, the healing frequency that you have probably plugged into. Yeah, definitely. The simple flow of trim. So when you're engaged with a wave, 
almost like the rail of your board is engaged with a wave and your body is very much engaged with the rail, with the wave. There was a very pure form of energy exploration mm. and energy flow that transcends words. And even more rootsy I find is I ride a board called an alaya, which is just a thin piece of wood with no fins. And it's just, it's an ancient Hawaiian mm. board and they say he'e nalu, which means and now I've got to remember what it means. It means, I, I believe it means to flow and to ride. You know, excuse me if anyone speaks Hawaiian, but Hei Nalu probably defines it. And in a sense, when I engage with the rail on a laya and just feel the most perfect trim, oh, trim and glide, trim and glide. Mm. When I feel the most perfect trim, it's as if it's like there's no difference between you and that energy. And you know, when you talk about, when we, when we talk about energy, you know, it's just that idea. I think Timothy Leary said, I've got a quote in Drifter that talks about, you know, the surfers are not the black sheep. We're the ones who are like, we're in the moment, in the barrel, yeah. with the whole world exploding around you. The, your, your, your footprints are gone. The future is unfolding. You're in the present moment, in the tube, just feeling this most perfect symbiosis. It's like yeah. enlightenment. Yeah. Like you are so... and. And every molecule and electron and neutron in the body is just poised and in action and active and you're just available. Mm, literally in the present moment. No other place. You can't getting, be. getting tubed is like baptism. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I, I, I've got some more practice to do before I, get, before I get to that level. Well, don't give up. No. Perhaps. Get tubed. If, if everyone on the planet got tubed, it would be a much better place. <laughs> <laughs> I think we said in a couple, a couple of episodes ago, I was talking to my friend Richie about our first ayahuasca experience, and we said if the whole world did an ayahuasca ceremony at the same time, we would have world peace. Oof. So I think perhaps if we could combine that somehow with a with surfing, uh, then yeah, we'd all be we'd all be vibing. Yeah, we need to get out there, don't we? We do. We it's, on the, surf. it's on the agenda. I need to. Need, well, I'm going through this process, and I'm I'm fixing the inside of my body right now. Then I'm going to start the uh, the outside soon. Build up the shoulders again, and start to, uh, and then get surfing. Probably not on Bingham Beach though, because the paddle out is absolutely exhausting. It's right on our doorstep. <laughs> it is. It's just a long paddle out. It can it? be. It can be. It is. I've got some fear to work through, I think, before I uh, get yeah. out in the binging, yep. the binging waves. Yeah. yeah, well, that's the beauty of it. You can start in your own. Like we, I, I've been going to Sri Lanka for many years, you know, with the kids. I've got three kids, and we go to Sri Lanka, the country of south of India, and there's some very gentle, beautiful point breaks, you know, with elephants and ancient Shiva temples and mm. peacocks and great curries. Yeah. Hideaway Aragon Bay is a great place to go. That's an unashamed plug and for a friend's hotel. That's good to learn surfing as well. It's great to learn surfing. Okay. Very gentle waves. Not like not really on the reef, on sand. Okay, cool. There's a little bit of reef at the main point, but it's a very good place to learn. You had me at not on the reef. Yeah. <laughs> so Jake, we, we first met you in your incredible bookstore within within yes. Drifter Cafe. And um, you've given us many book recommendations. You're very well read. And we um, wondered what your top five books would be that wow. you could recommend to someone wishing to learn the arts of living well. Right. Wow. You surprised me with this one. Now I've got to pull that out of ah, my hat. Well, you know all of those books, so we figured we, well, we figured you might have a, a few. That's a, and once again, it comes down to the type of mood I'm in on any given moment, you know, when you're ready to read something. But I would have to say, right now, I'm really digging the Four Agreements. I think that's a very good blueprint uh, and agreements to make um, for living. And it's a very simple book, once again. It doesn't, doesn't mean that it's not deep and meaningful, but it is quite a simple read. I have to say I love Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Ah, that's one of my favorites. <laughs> it has to be in that, the top five. Yeah. You know, I'm reading Emmett Fox, The Sermon on the Mount which is a beautiful book about the science of prayer, essentially. I've not read that. And he's a Christian mystic, but don't let Christian scare you away. He was a very open-minded, open-hearted uh, Irishman. And his definition of the Lord's Prayer is cosmic. Mm. Truly, it's a beautiful, 
um, yeah, beautiful uh, unveiling of a different aspect of truth. Once again, using the, the, the flashlight of Christianity as the language. Um, and then I read daily the Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. I love the Gita. And at the moment I'm reading Ek Eknath Ishwaran, his translation. I've got a few different translations, but I really like his. It's sim once again, simple. Very, it's translated in English. It's got a really nice, you know, he, he has his dialogue in there as well. How many is that? Four? Four. Okay. And then next, okay, I'll tell you what's next to the bed. Okay, I've got, th I've got three more next to the bed. I'm just going to tell you a seven. We Sorry. can have seven. All right. <laughs> so I am that, Maharaj Nisargadatta, truly cosmic. You can open that book on any page and just be dumbfounded. Um, the Surrender Experiment, wonderful. One of my favorites. Yes. And um, what's his other book? Surrender Experiment and... Oh, uh, Untethered Soul. Untethered Soul. So I've yeah. got that next, but I haven't read that in a while, but that is next to the bed. These are Michael Singer's books. Michael Singer, correct. Um, so that's just a little couple. You know what? And then I'll throw another one in. <laughs> because if you want something a little bit different that uh, could, could um, you know, fire your synapses up, there's a book that um, was written in the late 60s. It's science fiction. So it's a little bit different. And it's Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert Heinlein. It's a beautiful book. Mm. But scientific, uh, sorry, science fiction. Yeah. So that's how it's packaged. But it's very deep and cosmic and spiritual, you could say. Didn't Iron Maiden bring out a song called Stranger in a Strange Land? Likely. <laughs> Sounds like about right. Perhaps inspired by the same book. Run to yeah. the hills. <laughs> do, 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 do. Oh, man. Yeah, I was a rocker. I, was a rocker. I, I, I loved Iron <laughs> Maiden. Well, that's a really great list. I, it's, I, I think it's the sort of thing we should be able to add to on a regular basis. I'm sure there's a way for you to share your, uh, yeah. the, your top books. But uh, yeah. I, I'm, I always take your recommendations and yeah. slowly but surely, at least buying them. I'm not sure if I've got through them all. but uh, We have a lot to read, but I love reading. Well, so. we have yeah. a cosmic book club at Drifter oh. and we meet tonight up on Thursday nights. Okay. And so we have a short... <laughs> We have a short list of books. Carry on. Atti and Muda making a star appearance in the, in the show again. <laughs> Carry on. So, yeah, we have, a, we have a book study or a book club, and we sit and drink tea and talk about books. So um, I am going to be releasing the top 50 books in the library as kind of an updated, updatable um, the Stoic Daily Meditations is the new one I've just come across. Mm. So it's just a daily meditation book. Yep. And I also read Eileen Caddy. She's wonderful. I, I read her daily meditation. She was the founder of Findhorn in Scotland, mm -hmm. which is an incredible community, conscious community. And she has a wonderful daily meditation book. So I think that's probably enough books. Well, but it's a good, it's a good place for people to get started. I, one of the things we want the podcast to do is provide stories and utilities now we've we've certainly given them a lot of stories and and i think we're we're into the into the utility territory now by by giving people some inspiration for the things to read to to kick them off because of course it depends where you are on your journey doesn't it yeah i re i read it was robert back richard back who richard wrote Bach. Yeah, jonathan yeah, yeah. jonathan livingston Siegel. illusions and he wrote illusions yeah. well, i read illusions first which it's actually quite a complicated concept for somebody who, I, when I first read that, I'd, I'd not even meditated. I'd done nothing. I was frankly dumbfounded by the whole concept. And it was only about a year later I read Jonathan Livingston Siegel. I wish I'd started with that. But the point is you can, you, I, I, I think, I find that these books often find you, you know, like mm. where you are on your, on your journey of awareness. They, mm. they find you at the right time. Somebody might recommend a book, but. You say, all right, thanks, yeah, yeah, and you take it, you don't read it, and then suddenly two years later you're going, wow, that was amazing. But had I read it two years prior, it might not have resonated as well. Totally. I'm yet to read the uh, final chapter that's been found. Ooh, I haven't read it yet. It's, it makes complete sense. Okay. It does. It really does. It, mm -hmm. you, you, you could almost, it didn't really need to be written, actually, because you already can gauge it, but it's nice that he puts it into words. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, it's, I hadn't read that. I'd read it many years ago and was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, Ishmael's another great book. Yeah, I've got. Oh, that. we've got that, didn't we? We bought yeah. that after talking to you, actually. Yeah, Ishmael's a wonderful <laughs> book. An enlightened gorilla. 
Yeah, we've got to read all these. And of course, uh, actually, I was surprised you didn't mention the, the alchemist, Paolo Coelho. Yeah. I found a, a quote that I thought might be interesting to share on this particular episode. Paolo Coelho wrote, Don't fear the light within. May it ignite the sacred flame inside your soul. I like it. Yeah, I quite like that. So I suppose, speaking of Paolo Coelho, you're a beautiful example of an alchemist, in our opinion. Thank you. How do you think others can become alchemists for themselves? Hmm. Very good question. To, st to start with, the practice of meditation is a very good way of grounding oneself and um, bypassing the noise of the mind and starting to listen for the, that small, quiet voice that uh, will never steer you wrong, that comes from the heart. And in the three-dimensional world, are you joyous with what you're doing in life? Are you joyous with the profession you're in? Are you joyous with the living situation you're in? Are you joyous with the relationship you're in? If not, question it. What do you really want to be doing? Not based on your parents' preconceptions or society's misconceptions or your friends' expectations, but more what your heart really is singing like joseph campbell said follow your bliss but you've got to figure out what you really want first and when you figure out what you really really want then i believe that's when the alchemy really begins and the magic really begins in the sense of just creating your reality exactly the way you want it not defined by anyone else's perceptions or understandings but based on your own heart and your own true, true desires. And like I said, going back to the simple, the, the, the most simple fact of sitting still and being quiet and doing that daily, repetitiously for weeks and months and years, no doubt that voice will become much clearer. And if you listen to that voice and take action, then... Uh, that alchemy becomes more and more an active part of your day or the magic becomes more and more of your active part of your day. So, yep. I've got a lot of time for what you just said there, yeah. Mr. McKenzie. Well, I've got a lot of time for all of the things that you said, although unfortunately we don't have any more time for this podcast, <laughs> I don't believe. <laughs> We've given good time. Yeah. Well, I am so grateful to you for your attention and energy and and your words it's been a thoroughly enjoyable conversation hasn't it yeah thank you for sharing your stories with us my pleasure thank you for listening the only downside is that because we enjoyed it so much and we ran out of time we must have you back i would happily <laughs> to, to this environment for sure just my arm for sure well, thank you so and much with you too beautiful thank you so much thank you you are a superstar really appreciate it pleasure peace and love Thank you.